we are in a free moral and sexual harassment meeting and a fully inclusive discussion, okay? So, uh, with a brief wrap up of yesterday, uh, the idea yesterday was to warm up, warm up to uh, create opportunities for you to know each other, to know some of the initiatives being conducted, both in the presentations and in the groups, and uh, uh, create opportunities for your enthusiasm to uh, appear and to be shared. In fact, yesterday we started to build or to understand the background we have in terms of marine litter and interaction with society here in, in Brazil. Of course, there are several other initiatives that were not captured, and this, as this is part of a larger process. We understand that we will uh, include uh, other people and other initiatives uh, in the next steps. And then, uh, to move to the presentation, I would like to ask you to reflect, to realize about the name of the workshop. What's the name of the workshop? Hola. It's on ocean literacy. But we almost uh, didn't say anything about ocean literacy. We are talking about citizen science. So what's the relationship between ocean literacy and citizen science? That's the point. Today is the citizen science day. Uh, we are going to work on citizen science. A and the idea is to build a, 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 different, a different approach on citizen science. A two-way relationship between science and citizens. Uh, normally, normally, as you can, could see, as you obviously know, uh, citizen scientists are slash use it uh, to study marine litter, to have information on marine litter. And this sometimes engage, involves ethical uh, issues that we need to understand. And in fact, if you consider a two-way um, relationship, the other way is related to uh, providing information on the ocean, on the litter, on everything to them. So it's an it's a exchange, it's not a clientelist relationship. So uh, that, that's the point. And then we are moving today to try to understand what are the potentialities, what are the limits, what are the opportunities to do that. And to do environmental education, to work on ocean literacy with citizen science. Okay? So let's talk, let's share, let's build. And the idea, uh, when I, I showed you this table yesterday, <coughs> I, I am better, but not so better. Uh, the, derived from this, this, uh, this report published this year, I would like to show you these uh, policy concerns. Why? Because when you measure something, you need to know what do you want to do with the measurements. What kind of hypotheses do you have? what kind of questions you want to answer. Otherwise, uh, you will be lost, as normally we, uh, we are in, uh, when we start to do science. Né? Undergrad projects, master projects, PhD projects, normally we, f we fight against the, the objectiveness to have a, a hypothesis, a clear hypothesis, clear objectives, and then it's important to exercise that. No? Uh, the, the international uh, community is worried about that and started to think on how, uh, what kind of, of question a mayor, a governor, a president, uh, yes, an authority would have in relation to marine litter that could be supported by data. Are the tourism in Pontal do Paraná being impacted by, by marine litter? Are those 8.5 million, 8 million dollars being lost by the municipality, as I told you yesterday from the Allen's, Allen's study. So it's, it brings us to very clear questions that are being asked, eh, being made by policymakers. Since since and science can be a, an additional source of information, 
that information, mostly because we are relying on people, on expectations, eh? on, on a fair relationship with people, we need to take it, to have it crystal clear eh? why we are doing that. We are not uh, um, uh, trash in time, it's not the better word to say that, it's, we are not uh, making people lose their time eh? uh, to produce data that are not being used, okay? For science or for, for policy making or for policy evaluation. Okay, and then we, we, it's important to think about that. But when we were preparing these, these guidelines, uh, we started to think that almost everything is important when we intend to describe, to analyze money in litter. Because size matter when we talk about risk. Size so matter because if you have a big ship and there is a big container, the container is the litter, and then the ship can crush the container, crash the container. Crush uh, is another thing. No? <laughs> or if you have a micro-sized plastic, it can be ingested by a micro-sized polykit. <laughs> and okay, by a whale too, but the effect will be completely different. So size matter. Morphology matter, color matter, composition matter, everything matter. So if everything matter, we are stuck it. We are blocked because we cannot, if we are thinking globally that Brazil, Germany, US, and uh, Kenya, for example, need to do that, we have different capa capacities, capabilities, uh, resources, people to do that. So it's sometimes impossible to do all of this. And then we come to the consideration that it's too complicated. And perhaps we need to be simple, but still informative. And this brings us to the Occam's razor. It's a philosophical principle. Uh, I will read here. Uh, uh, it says, this principle says, no more things should be presumed to exist, exist than are absolutely necessarily. In other words, the fewer assumptions and explanation of a phenomenon depends on, the better the explanation. Translating it to Marin Litter, uh, sometimes um, simpler information is not worse, can be better, because we have in a larger spatial or temporal scale. We lose detail, but we gain in, in terms of scale. And we reduce the levels of uh, the degrees of freedom. We increase the degrees of freedom and reduce the number, uh, the, the quantity of noise in the estimates. So it, uh, there are some choices. And perhaps doing uh, this kind of approach related to citizen science, perhaps we are not looking at all of these things, color, quantity of pollutants inside the plastics, f uh, for uh, morphology, all of this, because it, this not necessarily can be done, and this normally can be correlated to other things. And then we need to, f to match or to adjust a little bit our potentialities to what is feasible, to what is informative. So it's a big challenge to understand what's the limit of that things. Okay, we need to have a balance. Otherwise, we are be uh, stuck it and do not move. Okay, and if we have possibilities to move in a simpler way, we start to do that. And then we introduce complexity as far as we get more uh, prepared to do that. So this is a message, it's not a, a, a it's a thing to, to think about. Uh, when we start to think on citizen science uh, in the context of marine litter. So two uh, final slides. So citizen science is an opportunity to get info on several policy concerns for several types of data. As here, this was produced by Martin. It is in the GESAMP report. <laughs> and you can see here, you can observe impacts uh, of marine litter on the biodiversity and you can estimate quantitative, quantitative data on, on litter densities. You, ha you can have 
very different types of information. You can go deeper or not. It takes time. It takes more people. It takes sometimes uh, that the effort will be able to be in place for only once and not for several years, which is needed to track changes in the ocean, to track the trends in the litter uh, composition or uh, the litter abundance. Okay? So if you demand too much information from people, uh -huh, perhaps you know, will not have that information forever. And the idea is that this information should be here forever. Why? Because it's not because of the information, it's because of the relationship. We need to create this, this dialogue and then um, receive things and give things. Because this is completely linked to that beautiful picture, that beautiful uh, and colorful thing that's related to the SDGs, and specifically here with the SDG 14.1, which is here. And almost there, here. Uh, and this is the, these are the goals for the Agenda 2030. We need to measure litter in the ocean. We want to reduce the litter in the ocean. But we are not eliminate the litter in the ocean by 2015, 2025. We, we need to keep going after that. So these things will be needed forever. And we need to have monitoring schemes, strategies, not only methods, transects, quadrats. We need to have strategies, special replication, temporal uh, um, replication that are useful forever. How to do that? citizen science can be a very, very strong and important approach. That's the message. Okay? Let's move on. Natalia will now bring you some insights, some inputs on, on citizen science, and then we s we'll start to um, think on how we can match, how we can put ocean literacy, citizen science, marine litter in the same box. Is anything missing, Kaylee? No? So... Good morning, everybody, and let's work. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Tuha, for a nice introduction, and he gave me lots of things to talk to, to you today. Uh, the idea now is to talk about citizen science and how can we think uh, on possibilities of using citizen science in the initiatives we were talking about yesterday. Well, citizen science is science. So science uh, has some features. Science is systematized knowledge. The hierarchy, organization, and synthesis of knowledge following general models and some principles. And we must keep that in mind when thinking about citizen science. According to Chassot, science is a language that we humans built to explain our world. So if we think of citizen science as science, we must think of addressing scientific questions in citizen science initiatives. What's the difference between scientific questions and other questions, other types of questions? So scientific questions can only be dealt with or answered, quotes our own purpose, uh, through the systematic observation of evidences. So we use uh, methods to do that and the scientific method. So we are aware of the scientific method, so we follow some steps, and citizen science need to uh, address also these uh, steps, in e beginning with the observation of evidences, the proposal of hypotheses, and following this, the test of hypotheses. So after lots of testing, we can build some theories, scientific theories. 
after continuing testing hypotheses, the science, scientists, the, live, the life of science, a scientist is to test things, to ask things. So citizen science uh, do it as well. So continuing to test hypotheses, we can make our theories more robust or rethink some aspects of our theories. So why this is important? Why this is important to follow some steps, some rules, and the scientific method? Uh, especially thinking on marine litter, we can uh, start to understand some patterns. From these patterns, we can start to think about the processes that lead to these patterns. And we can start thinking of previewing phenomena. And what will happen in the future, so monitoring. Uh, so with no patterns and what are the causes of these patterns, we can think of, under, uh, we can know with pa a pattern change, we can try to under understand why this is happening. So citizen science is science, but what exactly is uh, the characteristic of uh, citizen science. Why do we call citizen science and not science? Just. So citizen science has this feature. It's the collective building of scientific knowledge. So according to Secaroni and collaborators, it's the work undertaken with citizen communities to advance science because citizen science is science. At the same time, the goal is to foster a broader, a broad scientific mentality. So we can think of aspects of science literacy in citizen science. Also to encourage democratic engagement, which helps society to address complex and modern problems. Some benefits of citizen science. The data collected by citizen scientists can be very accurate and reliable and can be used both for science and for management and in basing public policies, for example. Uh, an important benefit of citizen science initiatives is the educational and social gain that citizen science brings to the participants of the initiatives. So f for some citizen scientists, the importance of participating is to have fun, to be in a group. So this is the social gain that citizen science can bring to these people. A sense of belonging, being part of a group, being part of a place, a sense of place is the, one of the advantages of citizen science projects. The participation in citizen science projects provides a, a forum in which participants are engaged in, in thought processes that are similar to those ones that happen in uh, scientific research. Also a sensation of responsibility. Yesterday we were talking about how can we turn uh, uh, citizens into activists. So citizen science can be a way to reinforce this sensation of co-responsibility uh, in social environmental uh, problems. As you can see, citizen science has this double, uh, this double aspect of being both a scientific process and also an educational process. Citizen science has an educational objective and a scientific objective. Why am I telling this? Because the term citizen science is not a consensus among different people, among different places. And recently, a paper dealing specifically with the terminology related to citizen science was published two years ago in a journal called Citizen Science Theory and Practice, which is a journal published by the Citizen Science Associ Association in North America. 
So, the, in particular, the, in citizen science, the terminology is very dynamic uh, because the field is growing and more people are coming together to do it. So, the views, there are different views uh, coexisting. And this is not a problem, but we need to understand that this happens. For example, uh, the idea of uh, citizen science as a process that is initiated by scientists is a view that is traditional in, in the citizen science uh, uh, world. <laughs> and just scientists uh, only recruit, recruited the participants to collect data. So this gives the negative idea that the volunteers are slaves or a, a source of free work. This view uh, is uh, changing, uh, I, I hope, <laughs> but I think it is changing. And now uh, the idea is that citizens participate in all the process uh, of science inquiry. And they may even uh, be the persons who initiate the process, uh, bringing their own questions to and asking for scientists for help. There are several ways that citizens can be involved in citizen science projects. So a typology was uh, proposed in 2011. So we can see in the table that citizen science can participate in the whole processes of science inquiry. Uh, from defining the question to gather information, developing hypotheses, designing the study, collecting data, analyzing, analyzing samples and data, interpreting, interpreting data, drawing conclusions, disseminating results, and discussing results. If they do that, we call um, that we, we say that the initiative is co-created. If, if the citizen science participating less uh, steps, uh, for example, mainly in data collection, analysis of samples and data, and eventually in designing the studies, inter interpreting data and drawing conclusions, disseminating results, we can call the initiative as collaborative initiatives. And, uh, and if the citizen science participates mainly in data collection, which is the traditional view of citizen science, and eventually in analyzing the data and disseminating results, we call it contributory citizen science. In 2009, uh, uh, published a paper uh, with a model for the development of citizen science projects, which encompasses nine steps. The first one, and uh, important one, is the definition of which scientific question will be addressed by the project, by the initiative. Generally, the citizen science questions have a large spatial or temporal scale. As Tuha was saying, we need, to, for example, to know the distribution of marine litter in different countries of the world, how it changes a long time. So examples of questions that can be proposed. What's the abundance of plastic litter on different beaches of Sao Paulo state? Are citizen scientists understanding the concept of beach quality? for example. So we can think of questions related to the uh, environmental problem and also questions related to the citizen scientists. We can have to take into account that participants are often amateur observers. So questions for which data collection relies on basic skills are more appropriate for citizen science projects than questions that require higher levels of skill or knowledge. So keep it simple, as Tuha said. Uh, the higher the question difficulty, the higher is the need for training and supporting materials. 
So keep it simple. The higher the project simplicity, the higher the probability that we will engage more people. As I said, sometimes it's in science wants just to go to the beach and have fun, <laughs> to join people. So keep it simple. The second step is to form a team. It's a problem to have only one person dealing with all the aspects of a citizen science project. So it's very important to think of a team composed of people with different backgrounds, formation, experiences. So uh, the ideal citizen science project should have a researcher, which is the person who will ensure the project science scientific integrity, we will develop the protocols that will lead to the collection of quality data and is the person who will, who will analyze and publish the data in uh, scientific uh, media or report. The educator or the communicator, or uh, ideally two people, uh, will be the person who will explain the project's important, importance and significance to participants. It's very important that participants know the importance of the project they are participating in, why they are there, um, who are interested in that. So it's uh, a communicator and educator rule, uh, role to do that. Uh, producing supporting materials, developing uh, clear and comprehensive support materials. This is really important. Uh, also, uh, it's, it would be ideal to have a person, uh, a computational statistician or an information scientist, who would be the person to deal with the database inf uh, infrastructure and the technology required to receive the data from the participants, analyze, visualize, and disseminate the data and results to people. Uh, nowadays, we have some online uh, tools that can be used to do that with uh, free databases, uh, free possibilities of producing our own data forms that I'll talk about some later. And finally, the evaluator, a person who will ensure that the project begins with measurable objectives. So if I want to raise awareness, I need to measure this somehow. So the evaluator will be the person who will ensure that uh, the project begins with measurable objectives. Also will be the person who gathers data to, uh, to assess the project's success. If you have clear objectives, we'll be able to measure if your project is successful or if it needs some adaptations, modif modifications. Well, you know your question. You already have a team and Let's do citizen science. So we need to develop and test and refine the protocols, the materials that will be needed to uh, perform the, the, the initiative. Protocols, data forms, educational and support materials. So regarding protocols, uh, the collection and submission of accurate data by citizen science relies on the clear data collection protocols, clear, they should be clear, simple and logical data forms. And participants need support. We need to give them support for them to understand how to follow the protocols. How do I do it? <laughs> and how do I submit my data? To whom I, I submit my data? So protocols must define a formal design or action plan for data collection. They must be easy to perform because we saw that citizen science generally are amateurs and they maybe will not have the skills for doing com complex protocols. Uh, they should be explainable in a clear and straightforward manner. They should be engaging for volunteer participants. And an important a step regarding protocols is that they should be previously tested. 
with a small group of people uh, that ideally wouldn't have a clue about what the issue that is being <laughs> taught uh, is about. So the, the, the less things about the, the subject that the people that are doing the pilot test know, the better because there we will know the difficulties, the possible difficulties in performing the protocol. So validation of protocols is essential. For example, the international pilot watch see this uh, protocol, the, this information regarding the protocol. There are clear questions. Where can we find pellets? We can find resin pellets in the stranded trashes along the high, high tide line or on sandy beaches. And pictures helping people to understand what it is. Another question, how to do it? How to collect and send pellets? So bullet points, clear, objective, straightforward. Before collection, clean up your hands. Pick up the pellets on sands with fingers or tweezers. The quantity of pellets, circa 100 pellets, are necessary for one location. Yellowing pellets are preferable, but what is a yellowing pellet? So, a picture to, for us to have a, 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 a model. Wrap the pellets with aluminum foil or paper. See? Clear, objective, anyone who reads that. I think can understand. Regarding data forms, no matter if they are on paper or online, they should allow systematic data collection. They should be clear. And nowadays we have some tools in the internet like Anecdata and Sitsai.org that allow us to build our, our own data forms and they are free and connected to databases that allow us to uh, uh, download the data that are uh, submitted by the participants of a citizen science project. So they are initiatives focused on citizen science that we can use to build our forms, our data forms. Even they have some uh, spreadsheets, a model spreadsheets that we can use. There is one in like data related to marine litter. <coughs> Everybody here can use. The educational materials, videos, podcasts, facts, you need to uh, give uh, citizen science these materials. Newsletters explaining the project, the importance of the projects is important for people to understand why they are, or they are going to uh, be there, participate or not. Uh, identification guides, poster manuals, everything that can help citizen science understand what they should do, see, look, and submit in data forms. So the materials are okay. Now we need to recruit participants. You know better than me, so there are lots of possibilities, but I was astonished by how you can engage, recruit people to participate in your initiative. So. I will talk about it, that I'm not a specialist in that. But we can do press releases, direct mailings, WhatsApp groups, Facebook, uh, snowball methods, ma newspapers, articles, flyers, presentations and events, lots of examples. We need to train participants, not only recruit, but train. Uh, Regional projects that are localized, they generally are easier to gather people together to be trained in presential uh, events. But large scale, the large scale projects can rely on online tools, like videos explaining what needs to be done. But also they can rely on uh, local partnership partners to promote these training events. Remember that the higher the difficulty of the question or the protocol, the higher <laughs> is the need for training and the hours needed for training participants. So keep it simple. 
The sixth step is to accept, edit, and display data. So whether a project employs a on paper data form or an online data, data form, all the information must be accepted by someone, edited, and made available for analysis, not only by scientists, but also by the citizen scientists. The public must have access to data. This is a, a, a principle of citizen science. Let it be trans transparent. Let's make our data available for everyone to analyze it and think of their own questions regarding this data. So allowing and encouraging participants to manipulate and study project data is one of the most educational features of citizen science. So if people can have access to data, manipulate data, think of forms of synthesizing this data, it's a way of learning science, learning how to do science, it's a scientific literacy aspect of citizen science. We should uh, put this to happen. So analysis and interpretation of data is the seventh step. Generally, citizen science initiatives produce coarse data sets. So it's a challenge for analysis and interpretation. At the same time, they produce big data sets. So this is an advantage because we, this creates a favorable signal to noise ratio. So there, are, there will be data uh, that is not so accurate, but and overall, we will, will be able to understand some patterns that will emerge from this data. So as much data we have, the better it is for uh, identifying patterns. The researchers can develop strategies to uh, identify data that contain errors. So it's also an important feature of citizen science. There should be a person which is concerned on the qual quality of data. This can be done by, for example, uh, in train during training, we can identify people who produces very accurate data and people who are not so accurate and try to identify the reasons why this happens. And identifying this, we can uh, choose not to analyze those uh, poor data and focus on very good quality data. Uh, generally, the validation of protocols allow us to see this, uh, which is a, a good quality data. Finally, disseminate results. Academic uh, dissemination of results in scientific articles tech or technical reports. Or we can think of uh, ways of disseminating to the society as a whole and through newspapers, magazines, TV, uh, broadcasting some programs and newsletters. Finally, measure outcomes. If you have a good scientific question, it is possible to measure the success of your science and science initiative. We can think of scientific, uh, the measuring sci the scientific contribution of the citizen science project. We can have some indicators of these scientific contributions like number of papers published in peer-reviewed journals, number of citation of the results of the project, number of researchers publishing citizen science research papers related to this initiative, numbers and sizes of grants received for these initiatives, size and quality of citizen science databases, number of graduate theses completed using this data, Frequency of media exposure of results. If media is interested, that's because your impact is high. And people are interested in knowing what you are doing. So, Also, we can measure the scientific literacy outcomes of the citizen science initiatives. For example, how long participants stay engaged in a citizen science initiative. Do they stay for a long time? They come back to do the activities more than once? Or they just do that once and go away? Numbers of participant visits to the project websites. 
if the understanding of science content is being proved in the participants, if uh, there is an enhancement of participant understanding of science process, better participant attitudes towards science is a necessity nowadays. Improved participant skills for conducting, so we can think of knowledge, uh, skills, abilities, attitudes. Increased participant interest in science as a career. So to measure these outcomes, it would be good to have a person who knows research methodologies related to social sciences in the team. Well, I think that's it. This is the uh, model for developing a citizen science. I hope uh, now you understand a little bit more about citizen science. And the idea is to think how citizen science can be included in your own initiatives. Thank you so much. This is the link for the Brazilian network of, uh, for citizen science in the Facebook, if you want to join and the, the site of our study group there at UFABC. Do we have time for questions? Who had the hand up? First one up. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, good morning. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. Citizen science is not really my field of work and I have learned a lot. Your last statement was the question I was about to make. It's how we can use citizen science for the social science research. Now you said that an understanding of research methodology in the social science is needed. I was wondering if you know any publication and paper or any research group that's trying to apply citizen science for like having uh, citizens following up like meetings or uh, for like coastal management meetings in different states and see the outcomes of that meetings to uh, promote social, social science research. Or if you know any paper or publication, or if you have work at like using uh, the citizen science, but the participants would be the practitioners. Uh, have you heard anything like that? Or have you seen any experiencing with this area? Thank you. Well, I know, I know examples of people interested in the social aspect of citizen science. There are groups. Uh, into the Citizen Science Association, there is this group of people interested in, in this aspect of citizen science. But uh, examples here in Brazil that use this social aspect of engaging eh, people to, to perform uh, citizen science, I, I, I don't know now, but it would be good if we have. <laughs> and just to add a, a note to that, um, because that's kind of also my area, is that I know there's appetite for it. It's definitely, I think, much more premature than citizen science for natural sciences. And there's often extra complications when it comes to like ethics and stuff like that. Um, so there is interest and there are some like, observational studies where citizens can get involved and looking at behavior and things like that but I don't think there is as much of a network or publications based on it, but if anyone else knows anything, yeah, do let us know. Yeah, there at UFABC, we, we go through this ethical process of trying to get some data from the citizen scientists. It's a long process, but we managed to do this in some of our uh, in initiatives and with some of our protocols to collect this uh, data regarding the scientific literacy aspect of the, the, the initiative, so. Got time for one last question. There we are. Uh, I'll go this way. Uh, 
Hi. My question is, in your view, how government can engage in citizen science and use the results in decision making? And also, how to measure it, the impact of uh, citizen science in government uh, decision making? That's a good question. And for example, uh, related to biodiversity uh, studies, we have some initiatives that are governmental, like uh, participative monitoring initiatives uh, that are uh, made in the protected areas. So it's a government initiative and uh, with in a network of conservation units or protected areas. So there, there is a possibility of doing uh, citizen science as a strategy, uh, a governmental strategy. Uh, how to measure outcomes is, first of all, I think this model for initiating uh, citizen science governmental strategy, uh, a solid one, I think is the, before measuring, <laughs> we need to plan to plan uh, looking for uh, the outcomes and how to measure these outcomes. So it can be, uh, I think it needs to be a process that is uh, collective, collectively built uh, with the help of different stakeholders. But I think it's possible for us to think of a national strategy, a citizen science strategy, uh, but we need to Plan it carefully. Thank you. Right, so now we have three talks after one another. If timing, yeah, it's good. okay. Um, so first we'll have uh, Daniela, and then we will have someone coming in remotely. Um, from the UK and then myself, and then it'll be a coffee break. What we will do is um, have three talks and then questions for all speakers um, at the end. So, please come up. I'll do a quick introduction. Right. We'll get the uh, slides. Yeah, the slides are all there. So, just a quick introduction. So Daniela um, is the national coordinator of the. Oh dear! <laughs> How do you say that? The was the national coordinator. <laughs> oh, was was yeah. the <laughs> national coordinator. <laughs> no collaborating. <laughs> no. <laughs> Centificos de, de la, la Basavos. <laughs> there we go. Get the English person to say this. Um, marine biologist from the University of Oh dear, uh, Fal Paris Soya. Sorry. Where did you do your uh, studies? <laughs> ah, eh, Universidad de Valparaíso. That one. <laughs> um, with a degree in uh, environmental management of natural resources. She has an interest in conservation and management of marine sciences with special emphasis on the integration of scientific research in the development of public policies. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I better stand up because I'm really short. <laughs> And well, thank you very much for the introduction. And also thank you for the invitation to be here to present our initiative, which is the Científicos de la Basura, or Literal Scientists in English, um, which is a citizen science program based in Chile, in, in the city of Coquimbo, where we study, research the marine litter problem uh, alongside school children and their teachers. Okay? So. Okay, so this is a picture of a beach in the northern part of Chile, okay? Uh, so, well, looking at, the, at, at this picture and any other beach, we can say for sure that we have a problem. And uh, we have known that a special problem is the plastic litter because of the characteristics of this element. Um, which are uh, that it's very durable and is non-biodegradable and some other characteristics that makes it uh, to last really, really long in the environment. 
And well, how Alexander said yesterday, right? It is really, really important to research, to investigate, investigate about this problem, uh, so we can have data, real data about the issue. <clears throat> and so, for instance, we can get to know the sources of the problem, so where the litter is coming from. And this way, we can propose the best solutions dire directed to the source of the problem, and so we can attack it to the, from the root cause. <laughs> But in Chile, until 15 years ago, more or less, there was basically no information, no information at all about the marine litter problem. And this is why in the year 2007, the Científicos de la Basura program was born. And for the first year, the 2007, this program worked only with schools in the Coquimbo city, where we are from. But then in 2008, so the next year, we already expanded to all of the country. So now we basically have a national network of school uh, research, which is a uh, schools and science alliance, where the schools investigate the marine litter problem collaboratively, collaboratively, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with the scientists of the program. And annually, we have about 30 to 40 schools participating in our projects that are from all over Chile, including even the Oceanic Islands, which are Juan Fernandez and Rapa Nui. And this translates into a partici an annual participation of about 600 to 1,500 uh, school children. Well, and now uh, we are also expanding even more to all of the Pacific coast of, the, of Latin America. So we are now uh, working with the schools from all of the Pacific coast, from Chile to Mexico, and we now have more than 30 schools participating in all of the, of the Pacific region. Also in uh, here, Rabanui and Galapagos. <coughs> so uh, what are the main goals of the, of the program? These are three. Uh, first, to improve the science literacy of the school children. Two, to generate relevant information about the marine litter problem in Chile first, and now in all of the Pacific region. And third, to foster uh, the environmental awareness of the school children that participate in the, in the project, but also the general public, their families, their schools, their neighborhoods, and the community in general. So now, uh, sorry, I will show you how we uh, work in the program to uh, achieve or try to achieve <laughs> each of these goals. So first, how do we improve the science literacy of the kids? For this, we have established um, a model for the national samplings yeah, the, of the investigation that we carry out. And this model consists of eight steps, steps I mean. <laughs> and well, the first one is to identify the question, <laughs> the research question that we want to answer with every um, project that we develop and here it's really important what Natalia was saying. We're working with volunteers and in this case also school children. So the questions need to be really, really simple but at the same time provide us with relevant information. Like for example, what is out there? What kind of litter do we have? Where does it come from? Or more uh, all the kind of questions so, for example, which are the dirtiest or cleanest beaches of the Chilean coast? <coughs> then comes the second step of contacting the schools to participate in the project and also scientific collaborators. So here we identify teachers or chairmen of the schools and we contact them directly by phone, email. This takes a lot of time. <laughs> and also we contact scientific collaborators in the in the different regions, um, so they can help the schools in the field, mainly in the, in the sampling activities, because we're doing science, and therefore we have to ensure the scientific rigor of the uh, protocols that are being used. The, then, um, when we have already the, the schools contact and they are compromised to participate in the project, so he, uh, now we start working with them. And first, we motivate the school children by means of environmental stories that we have developed in the project, 
these are uh, these studies contain scientific information about the marine litter problem, and and also uh, they tell a story. So it's a fun way for the kids to get to know about this and motivate the. Uh, investigation that they are going to carry out. So they all together read the, the environmental storybook in class, and also we perform some exploratory expeditions to the field, so they uh, get some more motivation to do the sampling activities. Then comes the introduction and training phase of the, of the model, and for this we have developed different guidebooks for the school children. Okay, these guidebooks depend on the, on the project that we are carrying out because in these 12 years we have done very, very different projects and a lot of them. So, uh, for example, this guidebook, the, does it work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this one was developed for a, a sampling of litter on the beaches. This one was for the sampling of river on the rivers. And this one, is part of our project with the Pacific Latin American Network. And also, we have developed manuals for the teachers. Okay, so the teachers may know how to best perform the activities with the, uh, with the school children. Well, the guidebooks for the kids, they contain uh, usually introductory dialogues, uh, we have characters that are leading the, the story, the research, okay, and also, um, they don't only, uh, the kids don't only learn with the, the guidebooks about the marine litter, they also learn about the marine environment in general, uh, oceanic currents, about the organisms that, that live in the marine environment, okay, etc. And, uh, well, the, these guidebooks also contain the research questions, fundamental for the, for the citizen science, and the sampling protocols. Well, we have developed a lot of sampling protocols, depending also on the, in the investigation. So, for example, we have this sampling protocol for the microliter on beaches, for the mesoplastics on beaches, also microliter on riversides, and some others. So, uh, our protocols usually <coughs> are based in the, well, the, uh, the main, well, I don't know how to say it, but <laughs> they usually contain uh, different transects. The, the way to do them, okay, is to establish transects that go from the, this one, yeah, <laughs> from the water line to the end of the beach, okay, <clears throat> and each transect contains different sampling stations. There are three per three meters, and they are positioned uh, in the beach in these specific uh, points, like in the water line, in the dry, uh, white zone, uh, in the high tide line, and so on. Okay? The number of stations depends on the width of the beach, of course. Uh, but we, have, uh, we need to have at least uh, two stations, one in the water line and one in, at the end of the beach. And in between, we can put as many stations at, as we can. And inside every station, the kids have to collect all of the macro litter they, they find, uh, bigger than 25 millimeters, and uh, classify it and count it. Okay, they usually do this on the beach if they have the time, but if there's really a lot, a lot of litter, they have to take it back to the school in a bag, a labeled bag with the number of the station, number of transect, name of the beach, the date, and everything, so the bag don't don't get lost in the, in the school. <laughs> and when they count and classify the litter, they use these uh, data sheets. So this is for the macro litter on beaches, this is for the mesoplastics on beaches, we have some others for the other protocols, but generally the main data that we record are abundances of litter and the types of litter. Well then, after the training with the, the guidebooks, they go to the sampling, to the, to the field, but first of all, before carrying any, anything, <laughs> they have to uh, know the site and the tools that we, they will use, okay? Sometimes the kids don't even know the beach. Sometimes they haven't even gone, never in their life. So they have to first familiarize with the place and with the things, the materials that they will use. And then when they are working, one really, really important thing is the teamwork, okay? Uh, here then, lo, um, the kids are divided in different groups. Each group is 
uh, in charge of one transect, for example, and inside of each group, it's important that the kids acquire different roles. Okay, so one, for example, will be the one uh, that established the, the sampling station, another one will be the one to um, collect the litter, another one will be uh, the one recording the, lead, uh, the data. Okay, so this way, the kids can empower themselves with, the, with their own role. They know the importance of their role and also the importance of the investigation that they are carrying out. Well, after the sampling, they go back to school and reflect about the activity and about the results. So here, they go to the computer lab and they have to, uh, themselves, have to enter the data in Excel sheets that we usually send them the Excel sheets already uh, done, so they have only to enter, and they, this way, learn to enter information, systematize it, okay? <clears throat> and also, they learn to make simple graphs. So they already uh, can see how much litter they have, and also compare it to other localities, lo localities. This picture, for example, is from our website. So we have had uh, some projects in which the kids can enter the information in the website and they get immediately this graph. So they can see the, the data that they have entered, but also the data that the other schools have entered. So they could already compare their, the results with the other regions of our country. Okay, and this is really important because it, su it supports the post-sampling reflection in the classroom. So they uh, compare their, their results, reflect about them in the classroom with uh, the other classmates. And then here comes the phase of compilation and evaluation of the data. So here is where we come in. So now the teachers send us all of the information that they have gathered and they, um, well, and now we analyze the data and we can answer the research questions. And so we come to the second objective of the, of the program, which is to generate the relevant information about marine literature. Well, now, um, up to date, we have carried out several investigations in Chile at the national level. So, uh, for example, we have done three national samplings of macro litter on the beaches every four years. Also, a national sampling of mesoplastics on beaches in 2011. Two national samplings of litter on rivers, also every four years and two national surveys about litter on beaches on 2010 and 2012. Um, these national surveys are surveys uh, that the kids perform on the uh, community, the adult community. They go and make a questionnaire to the people so we can know the social aspect of, this, of the marine litter problem. Okay, which is really, really important to know like the perceptions of the people about the problem, their attitudes, their behaviors, their willingness to change. Okay? So it's important to uh, propose the solutions to the problem. Well, now, for the sake of time, I will only show you some of the main results of the samplings of litter on beaches. Okay? Well, this... These samplings were carried out mainly to answer the question that uh, which are the dirtiest or cleanest beaches on the Chilean coast. So we performed this every four years, 2008, 12, and 16. And we had schools participating in all of the Chilean coast. And also uh, in the last year, we also included a school in Juan Fernandez and Rapanoi. Well, so here we have the main results of abundance of litter per region, okay? Um, so here, um, yeah. here we have our country, the different regions, the administrative regions, also the oceanic islands, and here we have the results for the first campaign, the second, and the third, and the, um, the results are expressed in terms of um, liter units per square meter. Ah, something that I forgot to say is that our protocol enables us to uh, compare the data between different places because we get a standardized uh, unit measure, which is the items per square meter. Okay, and well, 
What is the first thing that we can, be, we can see in this graph? The Antofagasta region is by far the most dirty in all national samplings. Okay? And we can also see that uh, it has an increasing trend in time. Okay? But also we can see that if we exclude Antofagasta, uh, we may see that there have been no major changes in time for the other regions. Okay? This is kind of unexpected because it, this has been a, an eight years period and we might expect a little change because environmental awareness is increasing, marine litter awareness and conscience. So, well, <laughs> there has been no change. Um, and also we can see that the average in the last year, it was 2.2 items per square meter. So if we think of our one square meter in the, on the beach, this means that on average, we may find uh, two liter items per every step that we take on the beach, which is kind of a lot. <laughs> Well, here we have the uh, composition of litter per zone, okay? Well, all of the different regions of, of Chile, we divide them by zone, okay? According to geographic and climatic reasons mainly. And the composition we evaluating, ev evaluated in terms of zone. So we have the three campaigns, the different zones and the different items, litter items that we measure. Uh, well, first of all, the composition is really, really essential to pinpoint sources, okay? If we measure the composition of the litter, we can know which are the main sources where the, the litter is coming from. So here we have papers, cigarette butts, plastics, metals, and glass. I'm sorry it's in Spanish, but I couldn't <laughs> translate the image, <laughs> okay? And, well, generally, we can see that the most frequent types are the plastics in green and cigarette butts in red. As you know, these elements are directly associated with the users of the beaches. So here we have a really probable source, <laughs> okay, for the continental beaches of Chile. And we can also see that we have high proportions of glass and metals, yeah? And these elements are also uh, very important because they don't float on water. So they have not arrived to the beach through water. So they have also been deposited directly on the beach. Yeah? And so this composition allows us to uh, infer that the main sources of the mar uh, marine litter in Chile are local sources. Okay? So mainly the users of the beaches, uh, visitors, residents, but also uh, activities that are carried out near the beaches, okay? Well, here I would like to highlight that if you, if you see, our classification of litter items is really, really broad, okay? So, um, this is kind of a drawback of our methodology, okay? Because it's really broad and we cannot s divide, for example, the different types of plastic. But, as Natalia was saying just now, as we are working with citizen scientists and school children, it's really, really essential to keep the protocols simple. So, here in this case, we sacrifice <laughs> a little bit of detail with the, the classifications in favor of simplicity for the citizen scientist. Well, and next comes the uh, feedback so, uh, step. So now we have the information, we have analyzed the data, and now comes the feedback, and also the third goal of the, of the program, which is to foster environmental awareness. And so how we do, do, uh, do, we do this? <laughs> uh, first, we elaborate reports with the main results, conclusions, recommendations, okay, and we share this publicly. We made the, the reports publicly available in our website, social networks, but first of all, before making the public, we share them with the teachers and the school children because uh, they are the main ones <laughs> that need to know these uh, results first, okay? So they can know, uh, the, the importance of their work, their collaboration, okay? And also, we publish uh, scientific publications. 
and we also do a lot of outreach in national and local media. So when we have the reports, we send them to all of the newspapers that we can at the local and the national level. And this way we have had a lot of media appearance throughout the time. And so now we have the relevant information about the problem in Chile. So what can we do about it? First of all, we encourage the kids, the participating kids, to share the results in the school, for example, to their classroom, to the other classrooms of the class, classes of the school, also in scientific first. And we have also uh, done two national congresses in Coquimbo where the uh, participating kids go to Coquimbo, all of them, well, no, two representatives per school, and they share the results with the community, with the general community. So they can um, share their investigations, their initiatives. Also, we, we encourage the school children to search for solutions, okay? So we ha they have seen, uh, based in the, in the results of the investigations, that the sources of marine litter in Chile are local sources, mainly, and therefore the solutions must also be local. And so they're encouraged, for example, to reduce, reuse or repair the litter, to reject the unnecessary litter, to recycle, but most of all, they are uh, made to understand that everybody can do something about this marine litter problem, no matter how old, how young, how big, how small. And now, that we have seen the, the program, I would also like to highlight that the generated information of the program have had some influence on the Chilean public policies. Because luckily, it seems that they read the reports, <laughs> or at least the media, and so in the year 2016, um, it was approved the law of extended producer responsibility in Chile. Unfortunately, this law is still not implemented. So it's, the, it's like nothing still, <laughs> because there are some regulations that need to be elaborated and approved and whatever. So it's not working, but it exists. Also, in 2018, it was approved the law uh, to ban the free service of single-use plastic bags, okay, in the supermarkets and the commerce in all of the Chilean territory. And also last year, it was approved the law to establish fines for littering on beaches, on rivers, uh, national parks, national reserves, etc. And, well, I would like to expand a little more about the internationalization of the Científicos de la Basura program. We have had uh, two, two initiatives to internationalize. <laughs> First of all, two uh, projects with Germany that we carried out in 2016 and 2017. Okay, so when we were uh, carrying out our third national sampling of litter and beaches, they collaboratively made, uh, carried out their first national sampling of uh, litter on, on beaches. And the, the rivers, we were doing our second, and in, in Germany, they did their first, okay? And we are now, from 2018 to 2020, we are carrying out our RECIBA project, which is our Pacific Latin American network that I talked earlier. And, well, about the Chile-Germany collaboration, we have already um, published the results of the, sam the national samplings of litter and beaches. So we have a diagnosis of the of the phenomenon in Chile, but also in Germany, and a comparison of both. And according the, to the RECIBA project, we will carry out two main uh, projects, which uh, investigations, I mean. So right now, in this year, 2019, the kids from all of the schools participating in this network are carrying out a social research. Okay, so which is a survey about the perceptions and attitudes of the of the, the people all around the all along the Pacific coast. And next year, in 2020, <laughs> they're going to do the sampling of macro literal beaches with this protocol that I had uh, told you about. And this will allow us to 
know about the marine litter problem in all of the Pacific coast of Latin America. Because up to now, there's basically no information in all of this region, in the Pacific coast. Okay? So thanks to this project, we will be able to know how much litter there is, what kind it is, and also uh, the sources. Where is it coming from in the different parts? Because the sources may be different. And also, this will coincide with the fourth national, national sampling in Chile, okay? Because we do it, we do it every four years, so this one will be the fourth, and we will be able to evaluate if this, um, if there, there has been any change in, in these last four years. So, well, uh, I wanted to do a quick review of what had been asked. To, to present here, but I think that the time will not allow me. <laughs> Two minutes. Two minutes? Oh, okay. Well, so for the overview, we have seen the program already, all of the model, the initiative goal, as you have seen, science literacy first, generate information and foster environmental awareness. The target population, well, school children from 10 to 18 years old, but also their teachers. And actually the teachers are the most essential here. They do all of the work, <laughs> basically. Without them, the program will not exist. Uh, how we recruit? Well, phone, email, but we have already a national network, so we don't really recruit anymore. <laughs> but for the receiver network, we had to do it uh, last year. How we involve them? Well, first of all, they make observations in the, in the project, but it, we also encourage them to analyze and interpret data, if not for the scientific publication, for their scientific learning of the kids. And also constructing and communication, communicating, uh, not, not so much as explanation, but solutions to the marine litter problem. Uh, the protocols, well, you have seen that we have different protocols, and the main data that we record are abundances of litter and types of litter. So the training, uh, we do it by environmental storybooks, exploratory expeditions, guidebooks, manuals for the teachers. We can't forget the teachers. And how we, do we share the data? Oh, no. No, no. What does the data show? <laughs> uh, abundance and composition mainly. And the composition allows us to infer uh, what are the sources of the litter. How do we share the data? Uh, mainly reports, national and local media, and the scientific publications. Well, the initiative and volunteers evaluation, I have to say that we have not officially evaluated the program or the project, but in 2016, when we did the third national sampling of marine litter on the beaches, we had a master student from Germany do her research thesis with us to evaluate if the participation in the project promoted pro environmental behavior in the kids. So what she did, what? Before the project, she did a pre-sampling survey, okay? And uh, after, a post-sampling, okay? To evaluate different aspects. <laughs> oh, time, it's time, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm almost done. <laughs> okay, and well, what were the results? I have to say that there were some changes after participating in the project, but not significant. <laughs> but why? Well, we attribute this result to the fact that our project was uh, focused mainly on science, not on promote, uh, promoting the pro-environmental behaviors. So we suggest that if we, we emphasize the pro-environmental behaviors, citizen science is basically a really, really good tool to, to achieve this. And finally, the lessons that we have learned, well, first of all, what Natalia said, <laughs> keep it simple. That's fundamental because we're working with people with no necessarily a scientific background. Second, uh, we need to listen to volunteers, to talk to the volunteers. We cannot let them do all of, uh, all of the work alone. They will not do it first of all. <laughs> so we have to be with them, accompany them. This is a lot of work, attention, and guidance that we have to provide them. It's also not uh, enough to just post a site where the people can just upload data. Okay? They need the guidance on how to do it, where, when to do it, okay? and they need to be remembered to do it. 
Okay. Third, we need to focus on the research question so we don't get carried away. We remember that we are doing science here. Okay. Uh, something that's also really important is to share the science with the scientists and scientists. Give the feedback. They have to know that uh, what is the importance of what they are doing. And finally, just like to highlight that a large scale project requires a lot of coordination of local teams. For example, our project is a national scale and now international. So we have coordinators in charge of coordinating the, the people in the different countries. So if you would like to do something similar here in Brazil, which is a huge country, it's really, really important to have people in charge of that. Okay, so it's a lot of work and time. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the time. <laughs> So now, hopefully, we'll be introducing um, someone from the UK uh, who I have been working with. Oh, yes, stealing that from us. Although she doesn't need it. Um, so we're, this is going to be a test of how well we can work with the equipment. There we go. This, hello, Lauren. Hello. This is Lauren. Hi. Um, can you hear me, Lauren, on the microphone? I can. Oh, perfect. Yes. Can you Take hear me? It's amazing. Yes, yes. Wow. Um, so we can see you. Are we able to see your slides? Hmm. <laughs> so while I don't that's being set up, so we can all now see Lauren's face. Um, so she is uh, speaking from the UK, and she is currently a manager of the Citizen Science Beach Cleaning Project um, for the Marine Conservation Society. Uh, we have been working together for the past couple of years now, um, and so Lauren will talk um, a bit about um, what their scheme is, how does it run, how does it work, and what they found. I'm very conscious we've got blue screens behind at the moment. <laughs> Still waiting. <laughs> we are here. Just blank screens at the moment. <laughs> I think that's quite nice. So we've got one screen of your <coughs> face. Um, and the other Ooh. screen will be of the slides. So we're on the first slide. Over to and you, Lauren. You My screen has gone blank. Oh. Okay. Well, we can see you, <laughs> but that's fine. I'll just I'll just talk away. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you'll you'll understand. <laughs> um, so yeah. So hi everyone. I can't really see how many people are in the room. Uh, probably about forty-six people. Oh, well, great. Good, good attendance. Um, so, yeah, so hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Lauren, as um, Kaylee said, and I have been running the System Science Project at um, the Marine Conservation Society based here in the UK for about eight years. Um, the Marine Conservation Society, we are a national charity who are dedicated to protecting our seas, shores, and wildlife. So we focus on three main areas of work. We focus on fisheries, so ensuring that everything's obviously su sustainable into the future. Ah, oh, fab, I can see the slides now. Um, and we working with supermarkets and on a policy level. We also ensure that all of the habitats are protected as well, so ensuring that we have more well-managed marine protected areas in the UK. Um, and the other area, of course, which is part of what I'll be speaking about now, is our, our clean seas area of work. So we work on both water quality, but also marine litter as well, and have done for a very, very long time. So um, the project that I manage is called Beach Watch, and it's the biggest volunteer cleanup project and litter survey in the UK. And I guess that's what sets us aside from all of the other kind of organizations in the UK doing this kind of thing. Oh, thank you. That's nice. I can, I can see who I'm talking to now. Um, so, so yeah, so I mean, you, all of you sat there in the room probably have experienced the same that we, um, you know, within the last couple of years, the level of awareness has massively increased on marine litter. And um, 
and we've noticed that right here in the UK. Um, but many, many other organizations that do this type of work, they just really collect the litter. It's just mostly about beach cleaning. But that's where we're unique um, because for the last 25 years, we have not only picked up the litter, but we've also recorded what we're finding. And you can see there in that slide, a couple of school scout, I think they're scouts actually. Um, so young people, you know, who are also taking part in that recording side as well. Is it, can everyone hear me okay? I'm getting a bit of feedback. Yes. Yeah, okay, fab. Um, so the, obviously the goals of the project are to pick up the litter um, because that's obviously just as important, but also to record everything that we're finding um, and then use that data to, to create positive change. So to use it in campaigns, to use it to um, you know, sort of create awareness with the public, to hopefully drive behavior change um, and obviously on a legislative, can't speak, legislative bleh, level. Um, so the project, as I mentioned, is national um, and we involve volunteers across the whole of the UK in that project. Um, we have about probably a thousand beach cleans that take part annually um, across across all areas and about, about probably 15,000 volunteers, um, and that is, again, increasing more and more as more people become concerned about the problem of marine litter and want to obviously get involved, do their bit, and take part. So we can move on to the next slide. So through the Beachwatch program, we it, it's, it's, it's very, very flexible, and it's open to people cleaning beaches all year round, um, but also over our one annual event in September called the Great British Beach Team. So this is a one-off event in September every year that runs over four days. And during this time, we again have volunteers all over the UK who are organizing beach cleaning um, and submitting the data straight back to us um, into our national database. So the Great British Beach Clean is, um, we've just celebrated its 25th birthday, um, but year-round cleans are actually a little bit older than that. So we've been running those for about 21 years. Um, so it all, the historical kind of, the way it's kind of evolved is that we, we did and, and kind of, pushed out the Great British Beach Clean event. And then that was so popular that we obviously wanted to do more. So we then introduced year-round beach cleaning to create kind of a national year-round program of, of beach clean work. Um, the Great British Beach Clean event is always on the third weekend of September every year. Um, and it actually links into an international project which you're probably familiar with called the International Coastal Cleanup, which is coordinated in America. So all of the data that we collect on that one weekend in September is sent to America to obviously report on worldwide litter, because as you all must be aware, you know, litter has no boundaries. So it's important to look at it, you know, on your media island nation, but on an international level as well. Okay, you can move on to the next. Um, so this one just shows you some of the information that the International Coastal Cleanup release yearly um, on the top 10 items that are recorded worldwide um, and actually links and coincides quite, uh, quite well with the information that we collect. We predominantly find small pieces of plastic, microplastic, um, on our beach cleans throughout all of our surveys um, and the, the public items of litter that you can see there like straws, cigarette butts, um, and bottles and cans and that, and that kind of thing. Okay, move on to the next one. Um, so everything is uh, managed on an online registration system. Um, it hasn't always been that way. Um, about 
probably six years ago, it was all done manually. So people who wanted to register to take part in beach cleans, um, to adding events, to sending in their survey data, was all sent in in the post um, to one of our offices, and it was all collated manually by a couple of people, which, as you can imagine, very, very labor intensive um, and took up a lot of time. Um, so we really wanted to, to try and make it a bit more efficient um, so the team who were, who were doing that work could obviously concentrate on other things to you know, kind of get more people involved in the project rather than kind of spending hours upon hours of paper collating and data entry. So everything is now um, managed on this online system. Um, and it's open to anybody, basically. So anyone who has the time or the passion, um, you know, to, to want to do something and take part, goes to the website. Um, so that could be individual, it could be professional, um, schools, clubs, companies. So anybody, we have a huge variety of people that, um, that sign up to Beachwatch um, to help us to remove this litter and collect obviously really important data. Um, it's really flexible to what they can manage. So we try and encourage people to survey, if they're going to do it year, so yearly, um, four times a year. So that's one per season, um, one in the spring, summer, or winter. Um, but if they can only do one, then that's absolutely fine too. But if they do do one event, then we do try and encourage them to take part over our Great British Beach Week in September, um, because we analyse that information, um, which I'll come on to in a second, um, and release the results of that information and what it's shown. So first of all, people must choose what kind of role they want to take on. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, and again, this is all managed on the website. Um, so, so people have the choice of two roles. So they can either become a volunteer or an organizer. Um, the volunteer route is probably the most simple route to go down because they go onto the website, um, they find where all of the events are advertised, and then they just can sign up to those events directly um, and then just turn up on the day. The organizer route is slightly more in depth. Um, and requires a little bit more commitment from, from their side. So it's kind of what it, what it says. They, they organize their own beach clean, which is quite useful because they have the control then to, um, you know, to set the date for, for something that works for them rather than as a volunteer trying to find something um, you know, which, which suits them that they can obviously go along to. Um, so... We could probably move on to the next slide. So they go through um, a process, a step-by-step -step process, um, take through that route as an organizer of beach clean. Um, first of all, they have to choose a beach, and that obviously is generally somewhere which is quite local to where they live, or perhaps somewhere where they go on holiday. Um, doesn't they don't have to obviously live right on the beach, um, you know, for them to be able to choose a spot. They could live miles inland and still they kind of organize beach clean on their kind of desired little patch. Um, they obviously they need to choose a beach and we have certain guidelines to to help them along that process. I mean most people will organize a beach clean which has good facilities, um, that has parking, you know, that people can get to. So we very rarely have beaches on our database where, which are a lot more remote um, and actually probably need a little bit more of a clean um, because it's just much harder for people to get to them. So, so they choose a beach and are taken through um, a process of how to then add that to the system or they can also sign up to existing beaches that are already on there that perhaps aren't currently being organized by somebody. So they kind of have a few options. Um, and, then, and then we have lots of guidance and materials to, to support them through that process to signing up to a beach, to then 
getting permission to do the beach clean, um, to advertising for volunteers to come along, um, and then what to do, obviously, during the day and, and following the beach clean, and ultimately getting that data back into our database. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, they are recruited through lots of different means, um, which you'll all be familiar with. So obviously the website, um, we try and drive traffic towards the website. Um, word of mouth, of course. So if people have come along on any of our events in the past, then um, you know, they are able to then spread the word to their friends and family. Um, we also advertise via e-news to our supporters. Um, at the Marine Conservation Society, we have members of the charity and um, you know, kind of spread, spread the word that way, uh, but also via press releases and, of course, social media as well, which is a great way to, you know, to, get, to get those messages out there at, at certain events. Um, we do a lot of promotion around our Great British Beach Clean event um, on the lead up to September. But actually, for the year round cleaning, um, we don't have um, as much um, promotion in terms of, of year round cleaning. Um, I mean, it seems that people take part in the program um, off their own back, and we don't do a lot actually to. To really drive that, but actually, it's something that we want to do more of, um, and it's something that we can do more of to get more people involved on that yearly kind of basis to, to build up our database of information. Um, so, so we have quite a strict methodology that um, we ask our organisers and then our volunteers on the day to follow, um, and because of obviously we're capturing all of the data, we need to ensure that that is robust as it can be. So we have a, a detailed recording form, which um, uh, I can show you on, an, on the, the couple of slides extra. Um, and it, it comprises of about, well, just short of 120 items, um, which are all listed in material categories, um, starting with plastic and polystyrene, which obviously is the most of everything that we find on beaches. Um, we ask our organizers and volunteers to survey 100 meters of beach, um, and that's going from the strand line to the back part. Um, and we ask them to do that so we can obviously standardize information from beach to beach, so we could look at different trends um, that perhaps are significant or, or not. Um, as I mentioned, our data set goes back 20, I've, that, that slide there that you can see is, is slightly out of date, but um, yeah, it um, goes back over 20 years, so now we're on to 25. Um, can we move on to the next slide? Um, so I mentioned that the litter is recorded from the strand line. So the strand line is the, where the last high tide reached. So it brings in all of the natural and the unnatural man-made materials with it. So. As you all know, um, a lot of litter you'll find kind of congregated in that area. Um, we ask our organisers to pace that distance out um, or use a tape measure and try and find something to kind of designate that area because you will find that use obviously volunteers on the beach, it is quite difficult sometimes to get them to kind of stay in that 100 metre area. Um, and it is quite a challenge for us in the project to, to really emphasize that importance that, you know, that we're asking for the 100 meters to be surveyed um, for a very particular reason. And um, you know, what we generally tend to do is ask people to survey the 100 meters for about an hour, um, which we find is probably enough. I mean, more often than not, you could keep going for much longer than that. But, um, but an hour is enough. And then we always say to people afterwards, you know, we'll kind of keep cleaning the beach, um, but, but not doing the survey just to try and make as much impact as we can. Because obviously people come to the beach and they want to, they want to you know, make much impact themselves and pick up as much litter. And I think sometimes people find it a bit frustrating having to be limited to, to that distance, um, you know, and perhaps just picking up small bits and pieces. Um, so I think that's really important as well, um, emphasizing about microplastics because even in the time that I've been doing the role, 
um, I've noticed a huge change in the types of litter that we've been finding um, because I think people are so much more aware. So they are, you know, just naturally going to the beach, picking up the bigger items that they're seeing. So, you know, bottles, bags, tires, whatever it might be, bit pieces of wood. They're removing those um, because they understand the problem, you know, and they have the concern for the problem. But it's the microplastic which um, it, it takes for you to do something like a survey or to kind of sit in one spot for a little bit longer to to pick all those individual pieces up. So, so yeah, so that's something that I'm finding that we're having to really emphasise a lot more with the groups that we work with on the beach, um, you know, and and trying to explain to them that they are having an impact, no matter how big or small the, the pieces of litter are, it is all making a huge difference. And it's actually, of course, the microplastics which are causing the most harm. So, so um, we can move on to the next slide. So I've talked about the 100 metres a lot. Um, and we, ob obviously, because we want to compare beaches across the whole of the UK, um, and that's why we are for 100 metres to be surveyed, but we also know that it's likely that in that distance we will find about 90% of all litter types. Um, and regular surveys over a set distance will obviously be a much more robust indicator of these different trends um, and allow us to look at you know, significant trends over time as well. So that's why we asked 100 metres. Um, it also um, links in with more European studying on marine litter as well. So we're trying to obviously ensure that all of the monitoring that we conduct is, um, is consistent um, so we can compare not only across beaches in the UK, but also you know, within Europe and worldwide as well. So I think we can move on to the next one. Um, so this just quickly shows the recording form. It's probably a little bit small up on that screen for you to see. Um, but it's just essentially an A4 sheet of paper which lists out, like I mentioned, all the material categories. Um, and then within those categories, everything is listed alphabetically, so it's quite easy to find. A lot of people are quite daunted by this list when they first kind of see it. Uh, but you'll find that as you kind of start monitoring, the, you, know, you, you find quite common items which will keep popping up again and again. So... So yeah, so people do get used to it, and our organisers who have been doing this for many, many years are obviously really familiar with these forms. Um, on the day itself, we, I mean, a, a sort of a typical average beach clean has about 30 people on it, I would say, and within that group size, it's split down into smaller groups, um, sort of smaller working groups. So you will have sort of a group of about five people. And one person will be kind of doing all the recording, a couple of people will be picking up litter, and then another person will be kind of holding the bag for everyone. Um, so that's kind of generally how it works. So you can imagine you will then have a few recording forms per kind of beach clean event. So it's then the job of the organiser to, to collate all of those forms together as one. And that's then uh, submitted to our national database. One thing that we're looking at um, producing is an app. Um, there are lots of different litter apps out there, um, but for us, it would take away, again, another element of this kind of manual work that it takes a hell of a long time sometimes to kind of decipher what people have written. Um, and of course, there is sometimes error in that because the organizer will come away. They haven't necessarily written what's on the recording forms. Um, and so there could be error within that. So we're hoping that an app will allow for these groups, rather than kind of jotting everything down on these recording forms, but to direct, um, directly input litter data to these apps, which will then feed straight to our database. So it will be, yeah, hugely beneficial for, for everybody and hopefully make things a lot simpler. Okay, so we can move on to the next one. Okay, 10 minutes. Okay, Nick. Um, and so we obviously give um, our volunteers and our organisers guidance of what's needed for these beach cleans. So unfortunately, we're unable to provide kit for everybody because we do have um, up to about 400 people who manage these events on our behalf. So as you can imagine, kitting out that amount of people is quite, quite a task. 
Um, and because we are a charity, we, we don't have a lot of funds for that kind of thing, but it's something that we, we do want to look into. Um, so we, these are kind of just some of the things that we obviously advise uh, for people to, to take down to the beach. As part of the recording forms, we not only collect the litter data, but also the environmental data as well. So what, what, the, weather, you know, what the weather's been doing on that day, um, and things like um, you know, if they're finding plastic pellets and nurdles, if they have found any oil or tar on the beach, um, or any dead or entangled animals with litter. So it's not just about the litter data, it's also about all the kind of associated data whilst you're kind of running that event as well. Um, but more often than not, or organizers get their kit from local councils because they will have to approach the councils to run the event, um, to arrange for the litter to be picked up by that local council, which is the beach owner. Um, so they more often than not do provide our volunteers with the kit to be able to do these events, which is, which is fantastic um, and takes the pressure off of us um, for the time being. So move on to the next one. Um, so our organizers brief our volunteers on the beach. Um, and again, we give our volunteers, our organizers, um, a lot of guidance on, on how to go about this. So they will mention anything in the risk assessment, which our organizers have to ensure that they either update an existing risk assessment online, um, which is connected to their event, um, or they have to obviously create a new one. So the events that our organizers are submitting online um, allow for volunteers and for anybody to take part. But as I mentioned, they can be private as well. But it's really useful for us to know, even if they are a private event, that they're happening just so we know that the data is connected to that event um, and also so it doesn't clash with anything else. So our organizers give a, bit, a little bit of a briefing, a little bit of background as to what everyone's doing on the day. Um, anything to, you know, connected to health and safety, um, so anything about high times, um, sharps boxes. So we have sharps boxes on, on each beach event to obviously dispose of needles or syringes there. Um, anything unusual or foreign, um, they give the volunteers guidance on how to record that. And obviously a real detailed explanation of the recording forms, and that's where we get our organizers to focus their time on because, again, because of this reason that the forms are quite comprehensive um, and we want to ensure that the data is as robust as it can be. So, so they're given um, a little bit of a rundown of the form, um, explaining how, how things are recorded. Um, volunteers use a tally system as they go along and then everything's collated in a sort of an end column um, with a total that helps the organizers at the end to kind of collate everything together as one. Um, we have guides as well, um, as you can see on the screen there, which help volunteers on the ground if they do find something to be able to identify it. Although the organizer does walk around the group just to you know, make sure that they're okay and to just kind of give them that extra support with the recording form if they need it. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. Um, so yeah, so I mentioned about the training, so lots of resources on the website um, and we have a really comprehensive organizer guide there um, that you can see. It's available on our website, so, or I can send Kaylee a link if you're interested in that guide and having a look at what we include. But everything is listed as a step-by-step -step in that guide um, from kind of, you know, the very first contact with us to what happens at the end. So that should be everything that an organizer needs to go about running an event on our behalf. Um, but obviously, we're always on the other end of a phone or an email if people need that extra bit of support. Um, we have run some kind of more face-to-face -face training in the past. But again, it's another kind of real funding-dependent thing. Uh, and we find that, that the resources that we supply online are generally enough to get people off the ground and feeling confident about what they're doing. So next slide. Um, we also provide in our resources some indication of kind of the more technical advice. So ensuring that people really understand, you know, sort of how to identify things. The esti we just can't take estimates, data. Um, next slide. And a little bit on confusion items, um, because as you're all aware, probably, um, if you've done many beach cleans, 
there are lots of things that look quite similar to others, um, and it's sometimes quite hard identifying them apart. So, so giving our, our volunteers and organisers a bit more guidance on those, again, ensures that the data is, is really robust. Okay, next one. So just coming on um, for the last points of the survey data and what, and what happens to that and what we do with that. So the data, as I mentioned, is submitted into an online system um, directly by our organisers, which obviously takes away a lot of the administration from our kind of staff at our offices. Um, when uh, a survey data has been entered into the database, you can see there some pie charts and it creates an automatic kind of summary back to that organiser for that individual beach clean, which I think is really important because I think the last lady I heard you say about feedback, and I absolutely agree that that is so vital um, to give people that feedback of what they found. Um, and then the organiser can then share that, that summary back to their volunteers as well. Um, so next, next slide. So the trends that we found, I mentioned that we analyse our data that we collect from our Great British Beach Clean event in September, and we have found over the last 25 years that the overall trend has been increasing. Um, there hasn't been a, a significant downward trend in that over that, over that time. Um, and we find, obviously, that certain items will increase, whether, whereas others would decrease over, over that period of time as well. Um, moving on to the next one, um, we also look at 10 items found, as I mentioned, like the International Coastal Cleanup do, um, and, and also where it all comes from. So I think I mentioned that very briefly at the beginning, that we, that we itemise every little bit of litter that's found, and we also categorise that back to where it's likely to come from. So whether it's public litter, it's fishing, shipping, Light it, um, or through related debris, or non source A lot of everything that we do find comes from non source and the public. They're, they're the two highest, as you can see in that, that pie graph there. Um, so, so we use a lot of that information to raise awareness um, with the general public and obviously other organisations and, and policy makers. Okay, next slide. Two minutes. Um, okay, doke. The. Um, where there have been policy changes, so back in um, 2011, the, um, we introduced in the UK into Wales was the first country, a plastic bag levy. Um, and since then, when we have any of these kind of key changes, we're able to look back at our data um, from when that change was implemented to what the data is showing now. So you can see there in that graph that plastic bags have shown a quite a huge reduction um, since the, the first levy was introduced, um, about a 30% reduction that we're finding on beaches. Um, and hopefully that is a, a true reflection of the levy that has been introduced. And we can do that, of, of course, for other items as well, to, to look at you know, the data before, before that tax or the levy was introduced, um, and then compare that to now. OK, next slide. Um, we also share the data with many, many organizations, because obviously, we're all working on the same thing. We all have very sh you know, shared goals that we want to ultimately stop the litter at the source. Uh, and that's what our data hopefully aims to achieve, to stop it getting to our beaches in the first place. So we share it really widely with many other organisations who are all trying to do that, that um, and, and with you know, sort of government as well to, to try and change legislation and, and input into more schemes to hopefully reduce the litter, um, you know, sort of where it's coming from. Um, and the next kind of big thing in the UK is deposit return systems. And our data, again, has influenced that process, that consultation um, period um, for getting those reintroduced into the UK as they are fully in kind of, you know, sort of function um, in other countries and shown to be really, really popular um, and really, really effective as well. Okay, next slide. Um, and and that, that's it. Um, the lessons that we've learned along the way have been um, to keep it simple, um, to keep instructions simple, to have a really simple website. Our website is great, but it is a little bit clunky. It has definitely got room for improvement. Um, so just trying to keep that as simple as we can and ensuring that we give our volunteers and our organizers as much support as we can, that we're always kind of on the, on the other end of a phone. Um, and really kind of, as I mentioned before, providing that feedback 
back to our volunteers, and that's something that we're trying to do more and more of um, as we, you know, as we sort of go through into the next five years, is providing our volunteers and our organisers kind of key facts, um, data on what they are doing on the ground does have an absolute effect um, and is hopefully going to change the situation around because that's ultimately why they're getting involved in the first place. So thank you very much. I hope that was um, okay um, and understandable. Brilliant. Thank you. So thank you, Lauren. I think now we will not see you for a moment. Um, and I will now give a bit of a talk. I think, Alex, are you going to introduce me? So thank you very much, Lauren. Um, we'll oh. probably put you back on the screen in uh, uh, 20, 20 minutes, and then we'll have a okay. group um, question and answer session. OK, then. Thank you. So now it's me. No worries. Thank you for bearing with us, everybody. Uh, so now I will talk a bit about my research, which actually ties on from what Lauren was talking about. Uh, so Lauren talked about the actual citizen science um, and how to collect valuable uh, data in terms of the natural sciences. Uh, and now I will be talking about the volunteers themselves. So citizen science, what is actually, um, what about the citizens behind it? What are the impacts? Um, on them. And so, when it comes to volunteering generally, just with cleanups, uh, there's often an intention, uh, as we've heard yesterday and today, to help um, them learn about science, learn about uh, environmental issues, and also get some benefits from it. So often by volunteering in these type of schemes uh, can result in feeling good about yourself, improving your health and well-being. Uh, you often have uh, the intention to learn something new and um, will become more aware of the issue. But we don't really know much about the actual results. So often the intentions, and there might be some um, surveys which have been done afterwards to get people to uh, think back and report what they found, but there's very little work which actually has fully assessed it. And so one thing which um, I've looked at is the impacts of beach cleaning specifically and those with citizen science components. And we know that by going to the coast, there's lots of evidence to show that just spending time at the coast is beneficial for us. It can help improve our blood pressure, reduces stress, uh, improves our mood, and um, uh, improves our ability to concentrate as well. But we also know that by going to the coast, people might leave litter, litter might um, wash up, and this can actually have detrimental effects on people. So it can actually take away those benefits. Um, people will be disencouraged to go to the coast or places where they know there might be litter, and actually you're not getting those initial benefits. So my question is then, these beach cleans, are they good for the volunteer or bad? They, in theory, they could be bad because you're making them focus on such a negative issue and seeing the litter, so is that actually harming those volunteers? Or is it good because they're doing some form of volunteering? So that's what we looked at. Um, over the course of numerous studies, we've looked at what are the impacts on the volunteers in terms of their well-being, so this is kind of their happiness and mood, um, their awareness of the issue, uh, and then their pro-environmental intentions. Are they likely to volunteer again in the future? Are they likely to change their behaviours back at home or recycle more or not litter? So today, I will just very briefly talk about uh, two studies, um, both involving the uh, Marine Conservation Sci Society's protocols that Lauren mentioned, um, and using two different populations. So the first study, I'll overview the social science methods that were used and the findings, and then we'll move on to the next. So study one, this was done uh, down in Plymouth in the UK where we did a questionnaire survey looking at volunteers' experiences before and after a beach clean. And so this is just a very um, short kind of survey, one page or two pages, um, before and after the beach clean. 
We also did a third measure um, point, which was um, a week later to see if there was any like long-term changes and stuff. With this, this was an experimental um, study where we um, didn't look at actual volunteers because they're already interested, they already know stuff. Um, we wanted to know what are the impacts of this activity itself. So we got a naive um, sample of um, individuals, these are university students, and we got them to do a beach clean or one of two other activities. They either did a beach clean for an hour using the Marine Conservation Society protocols. They either did rock pooling, um, which is looking for the um, biodiversity uh, in um, the rocky shore, doing again citizen science, um, part of the, the shore thing um, protocols, or a coastal walk, the most common activity people do on the coast. And so we did this using students, uh, and we asked these different aspects, and wanted to know what are the unique impacts of beach cleans compared to just going to the coast. So we asked things like um, for well-being, we asked them to rate uh, their mood on a number of things. So how happy they felt, how uh, frustrated, calm, and so on. And also how worthwhile um, the activity was in their day-to-day -day, um, kind of life. We then asked about marine litter awareness, both subjective, where we asked them to rate how confident they felt they knew about marine litter, but we also tested them. So we asked them some multiple choice questions, and then we compared that to um, the results. Um, and we did the same when it came to marine biodiversity as well, asking them to, for this example, they had to state how many of these are found in the UK. You'd probably think the UK is quite gray and dull, and so all those colorful things aren't there. Uh, fortunately, we do have some color too, uh, and all of these can actually be found in the UK, so a bit of a trick question for them. Uh, and then we asked them to rate how often they'll do pro-environmental behaviours. So what we found with this group is that uh, on these different ratings, for mood, their overall happiness was rated quite highly, and that didn't actually change both over time, and there was no difference between the three different groups of students. Uh, we then uh, looked at meaning, how worthwhile they found the experience, and this, again, was rated highly and didn't change over time. Um, and there was only one um, statistical finding here where the beach cleaning uh, volunteers or students uh, found this to be much more meaningful and worthwhile uh, and important compared to the other conditions. We then looked at awareness, and we found that it didn't matter what you did, um, all activities, they generally felt more confident in their knowledge uh, immediately after going to the beach. But when you break it down into the different um, groups, different conditions, we found the coastal walk didn't really change at all, but it was those two which used citizen science suddenly felt more confident in their knowledge about the marine environment. This went up uh, from before to afterwards, um, and it didn't really change um, a week later, statistically that is. When it came to looking at their actual knowledge, when it came to marine litter, we didn't find any change in terms of time um, between conditions. They work; they're okay the, with the results. So they're around the 50% mark on how accurate they were with the multiple choice questions. And then intentions. This shows that um, from baseline to immediately after, all groups increased with their intention to, um, to behave more sustainably. Uh, and this declined a little bit for the follow-up, uh, but still remained higher than baseline. Um, and this was found for all conditions. So it didn't matter what you did with the coast, as long as you go to the coast, you'll then report that you'd want to change your behavior to protect it more. But when we asked about their intention to do beach cleans in the future, what this shows is that immediately afterwards, those who actually had that hands-on experience intended to do it again in the future. Fortunately, you can see that it drops again um, a week later. Uh, so kind of a take-home message or a suggestion for this would be um, if you want to um, try to encourage participation, is to give them a trial in some way. And there's lots of different initiatives where they're trying to engage like, school groups or different industry partners to have a, a day out on the beach and do this for like corporate responsibility and uh, those type of schemes. 
And it's during that trip is where you need to get them to commit to another beach clean. If you leave it a week later, they're back to their everyday lifestyles, they forget about it and they, they're less likely to volunteer again in the future. So what we found with this study is that it didn't matter what you did, um, it was pleasurable for everybody and um, pro environmental behaviours or intentions um, improved, increased um, by going to the coast. When it came to citizen science, uh, subjective marine awareness was found to increase. But the things which were unique for beach cleans specifically, and uh, citizen science with beach cleans, is that uh, they found it much more meaningful, and they then intended to do more in the future in terms of beach cleans. So that's using students. We can start picking out what are the actual impacts of this environment and this activity. Um, but what are the actual impacts on the real volunteers, the people who are already helping out or will help out in the future? So, and also when it comes to this, this was a novel activity for a lot of students. Um, so do, do these effects actually remain for people who repeat uh, and volunteer regularly? So study two, we looked at real volunteers. So over the past uh, four or five years, um, myself and my colleague, Sabina Powell, have been working with Lauren and, and have actually been doing surveys on their volunteers. Um, this is just an example from 2017, uh, where we, I say we, Lauren did all the uh, legwork with this, uh, we did a survey um, out on the beaches on I can't remember how many beaches it was now. Um, I think like 15 different beaches, and we got everybody who was volunteering to do a survey immediately before and immediately afterwards. And we again measured those um, aspects, well-being, awareness, and intentions. But we also asked about the connection to the environment. So this is a, a measure which I'm very um, fond of and study a lot of, and it refers back to what Natalia was saying about sense of place and that kind of connection. And this has um, big implications in terms of marine um, behaviors and so on. And we also asked about their perceptions about marine litter. So what we found is that um, with all of these measures, they were rated quite highly. So with well-being, this is on a scale from one to five. People are very high up there, um, but we did still see an increase. So they were happy, but after a beach clean, they left even happier. Uh, same with a connection to nature. They were already quite um, connected. They had a relationship or felt like they had a relationship with the uh, marine environment, and this actually strengthened after doing this activity. And they all found it to be a meaningful and, and worth, worthwhile activity to do. In terms of perceptions, we asked things uh, like, is it easily solved? Is marine litter easily solved? And with this, uh, most people were around the mid-neutral um, point of the scale, so they neither agree or, nor disagree. And this doesn't really change before and afterwards. Same with feeling helpless. Do they feel empowered? Do they feel they can do anything about it? This was around the midpoint. They don't strongly agree or disagree, which in itself is quite interesting. Um, and emphasizing that that's probably something we need to focus on is to empower people uh, and know how to um, try to address this issue. And probably not that surprising, as i have all volunteered their time on a Saturday or Sunday, uh, they're all concerned about um, the impacts, and this was seen to increase after uh, actually going and collecting and reporting it. Subjective marine awareness was found to actually increase um, afterwards. Um, so generally they felt um, uh, that they had moderate understanding about marine litter, but this um, was stronger after doing this activity. And then when we asked about their intentions to do different behaviours, um, we asked a number of um, things, um, some of which they just did not agree with. So this is like sanitary um, products down the toilet. In the UK, we do flush um, like toilet paper and stuff down, but we should not flush nappies or wet wipes and stuff down, but some people do. This um, sample did not. Um, and we asked about other things, like do they donate um, to marine charities? Will they volunteer again in the future? Will they recycle, uh, encourage family and friends to do more, and avoid plastic packaging when necessary? And these were all found to increase after doing this activity. So that's generally the findings um, for the whole 300-odd uh, um, uh, sample. 
But we also looked at how the role of experience can have an influence. So comparing people who've never done it before and the people who have. And what we found, there was two key findings from this, is that um, when it comes to level of concern, the people who volunteered before, so this is the red line, um, were already highly concerned about the issue, and this stayed the same afterwards. Um, but it was the novices, the people who'd never done it before, uh, they were less concerned compared to the experienced volunteers, and this increased. Just after one trip, one experience, this was then starting to match those existing volunteers. And then when it came to the subject of marine awareness, seeing how uh, confident they felt with their knowledge about it, uh, the uh, existing volunteers, again, were much higher than the novices, uh, and they both increased, but more so when it came to those people who'd never done it before. So the take-home findings from that particular study is that well-being and connection to nature um, increased after doing a beach clean. Their concern Awareness and intentions also increased, um, and the concern and awareness was much greater when it came to um, the novices. So the next steps, this is where kind of I'm interested and would like to go further, is can these findings actually be re replicated in other countries, across other initiatives, um, using different uh, groups uh, and volunteers? Um, and also to start to look at, are these... Um, subjective marine awareness changes, the same for objective um, marine awareness. There is that thing, uh, with citizen science, we want to um, improve the literacy in terms of how science works, but we also, I think probably all of the campaigns which we've heard over the last two days, it's about raising the awareness of marine litter, the issue, but also the um, solutions for it. Um, and we need to actually assess this. Are we actually addressing that objective? So, um, overall, these findings, along with some other studies that we've done, has shown that beach cleans um, are seen uh, positively by the volunteers and the people doing it. Uh, they find it enjoyable uh, and meaningful. Uh, they do um, get a greater sense of connection to that environment, and they enjoy it. Um, volunteers are generally concerned, as you'd expect, um, but they, this can actually increase. Uh, and there is uh, the point that they do, don't find that marine litter is an easily solved issue, which I think we probably all agree in this room, um, which is shown by the helpless question that shows the need that we need to work out how to empower individuals. So I think we want to know the answer to that as well as the volunteers. Um, and that they tend to learn more or feel more confident in their knowledge uh, and they report that they will do other um, pro-environmental behaviours, so not only volunteer again in the future, but also change their other behaviours. So that is a quick run-through of some evidence out there to show the impacts of these type of initiatives, um, and that is me. Thank you. So I think now it's probably over to questions. So if I could ask um, Daniela to come back up again, and we'll see if we can get Lauren back on uh, Skype and have her face on the screen. Um, and Natalia, you didn't really have many time, much time for questions for yours. I don't know if you'd like to join as well. Um, and then we can open the floor to any questions to any of us. Uh, it's a question to Lauren. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Good. So, um, Kylie ha sort of answered the question, but um, there's still a detail that I would like to know from you because now you have 25 years of surveying. And I would like to know if when the people engage, volunteers or organizers, if you have some space for them to provide information that allows you to, to draw their profile. Who is engaging across the country? Who has been engaging along the time? If you have conditions today of analyzing who is your volunteer at the first place? 
Yeah, so that's always a really important one, isn't it, to understand your demographic. Um, but the answer is not really. Um, we started to collect data on age um, a few years back, which was connected to some funding. So we do actually collect that now. Um, but all we can really report on is quite basic information, such as how many volunteers we have um, and where they're from. But in terms of whether they're male, female, um, you know, sort of what kind of background they come from, it's very difficult. And we have new data rules um, in the UK now. So it's made it even harder to, you know, to, to collect that information. Um, you have to have, you know, sort of a real purpose for it um, and to ensure that that's kept absolutely confidential um, and used in the appropriate way. So. So yes and no, does, um, yeah. does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I think there was another question. Yes, uh, my question is for Daniela. Uh, first, thank you for your presentation. Scientificos de la Basura was always an inspiration for us. And it's a very complex project you have been able to complete a difficult cycle from collected data with children to, publish, um, to publishing scientific reports and influencing public policies. So congratulations. And my question is, uh, what's the principal difficulties that you have nowadays to keep school, Chilean schools participating of the project? And how are the strategies that you created to spread the project around Latin America Pacific Coast, getting the participation of schools in the countries? <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, thank you for your questions and for your congratulations. Um, well, usually for the first question, <laughs> um, the difficulties uh, to work with the schools, who was it? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it depends. Um, we usually try to maintain more than the schools, the teachers. Okay, so the teachers are more uh, fundamental citizen scientists. Um, we have even, even had some cases where the teacher exchange school and the project goes with the teacher to the new school. Okay, so that, that's really important for us, to keep the teacher participating. Uh, oh, well, and sometimes the school is still interested in, partic in continue participating, so they assign another teacher. <laughs> so we have had uh, both cases. And well, sometimes the most difficult thing is to have the, the support of the chairman or chairwoman. Okay, so uh, it's really, really important that the teacher in each school have the support of his boss <laughs> or her boss. Okay, so um, we have overcome that or tried to by explaining the project really, really well to the teacher and make the teacher explain it to the boss. <laughs> and then when they compromise to participate in the project, they have to sign a compromise letter, okay, which is signed by the teacher and the chairman or chairwoman <laughs> of, the, of the school. So this way we have at least a, a compromise of both parts to participate. But the most important thing is that they really understand what the project is about what they are going to, to do, to perform, what it, it uh, involves, and everything. Uh, and for the expansion to Latin America, well, it's really, really a lot of work. <laughs> First of all, we had to recruit the schools from the different uh, countries. Uh, we made like a massive call <laughs> in social networks. So people contacted us uh, to participate. We also um, contacted schools and people in NGOs who could help us to recruit the schools. And now we are working with the schools, uh, mainly via email, Skype. Uh, we are now also holding webinars 
like massive meetings with the schools, so we can maintain this, this network with all of the participating teachers. I'm not sure if that's the reply to your question. <laughs> Hello, and uh, thanks a lot for the great speeches of all of you. Uh, I'd like to know something about the financial support that you, you have for your research. Because nowadays in Brazil we have in a very difficult situation related to that. And I'd like to know uh, if it's something from government or if it's from private foundations like that. Thank you. Question. For, Daniela? Daniela? Right. for me? Uh, okay. <laughs> Hello. Well, uh, that's a good, really good question. Well, in Chile, we are kind of lucky that there is a governmental institution called Explora, okay, which is part of the National Commission for Education and Science. And this, this program finances different initiatives that are um, focused on raising the um, or improving the scientific teaching in the schools made by uh, by people or organizations that are, uh, that work outside outside the school so this explorer program is the one that has finance funded almost all of the projects of the scientificos de la basura throughout the time okay so we are kind of lucky to have that that chance chance and afterwards well i think it's been like three years now or something that we have not been financed by explorer <laughs> it seems that they have gave us a lot of money already and they don't want to give us more <laughs> um, and we have had the financing of other institutions by, for example, the U.S. Embassy in Chile. And uh, now, in, for the Pacific Latin American Network, we are being funded by uh, the Pew Caritable Trust from the U.S. But I, uh, I think that this has been possible thanks to the visibility that we have acquired in the previous years, thanks to the financing of Explora. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. I like it very much, your presentations. Um, and for sure, my question is for Kaylee. <laughs> I was, uh, I know your work, I like very much. And um, I was thinking to, fr to, I would like to discuss you, with you two things. First, how you measured intentions. Actually, I want to let you have the opportunity to talk about the theory behind your work that you didn't have time. So I thought you used the theory of planet behavior, but I don't know because I didn't, uh, couldn't read the article. And the other thing is how you see this effect that our most of your data, they are higher, they are in the higher point. So how to deal with this? Because uh, we, we know that uh, we have a lot of information behind this information that uh, it seems that just go to the beach, make people pro-environmental, and we know that it's not true. And I would like that you tell me about this as well, okay? Perfect. So lots of questions actually in there. Oh, sorry. Um, so first question, I guess, was like, how do you measure um, behavioural intention? Um, there's a whole lot of uh, work out there which tries to assess that. The best thing to do is to measure actual behaviour, but that's very difficult to do. Um, and so an easy way of approaching this is to actually ask people to report either what they've done in the past, um, what do they um, plan to do, uh, and that's where the intention comes in. So my questions that I ask are like, in the future, or in the next 12 months, how likely is it you will do the following behaviors? 
and then it'd be like pick up litter found on the street, encourage friends to do beach cleans and so on. Um, and we try to ask a number of questions so that we can um, look at them individually, um, but also have a mixture in there, some very like hard ones, some easy ones, some very public ones, some private ones. So all these different behaviors are influenced by different things. And that's where um, uh, probably the loaded question came from when it comes to the theory. Uh, Psychology, um, specifically, is very theory-driven. Um, when we're talking about, in science, developing hypotheses, um, we look at previous literature. Some of this is empirical work, but also theoretical work um, to help guide our questions and our uh, designs. And so with this, there's lots of um, different theories which try to explain why people behave the ways that they do. Uh, and so with this, um, the theories have been much more on the engagement with the environment. Um, there's lots of work which shows that when you're happier or when you um, enjoy going to the coast, that can then lead to um, pro-environment behavior. Um, and that's where it goes from evaluating an initiative. You need it to be quite a brief, short survey, which when working with different NGOs, um, this is not very brief. But when working with um, uh, psychologists, this is very brief. We like to ask lots of questions. Uh, and so that's often where the compromise is, is um, to, for me to keep my psychological rigor, um, but not be overwhelming and then lose participants and people not willing to complete such a long question. So it's that balance. Uh, and that's one question. And then I, I think you had two or three. One which was like high ratings. Um, that is one thing that's probably more a statistical question. When everybody is already rated quite highly, how can you show change? And that's probably quite impressive that we do find the change. There is enough variation there. Um, and then how does intentions translate to behaviors? And that's where it's probably important to work with like social scientists, where you get an indication that intention might change and there might be more uh, it's more salient and people are more aware, um, but it'd be good to have a follow-on to then work out have they actually changed their intentions. So I think there was questions yesterday about having more long-term data. Um, so following this, um, the children who are participating in the scheme, seeing how their attitudes or maybe uh, knowledge and behavior changes day to day and then onwards, do they actually keep it going? So yeah, I think that's all of your questions. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time, and then uh, I would like to thank all of you, Natalia, Daniela, Lauren, and Kaylee. I have good news because this is coffee break. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Lauren, we are not being Aww. offering to you. It's good food. <laughs> but next time, <laughs> we hope to, I'll go get my own. to be with you. And yeah. thank you very much. I think uh, everybody can approach uh, Lauren by email or other means to talk a little bit more about things. And you can have these three ladies for the rest of the day to chat and discuss and catch up and up, uh, go deeper into these, these issues, okay? Brilliant. So thank you very much and please, uh, 15 minutes of coffee break.